بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this live program of Islam Guide which will be insha'Allah coming to you live from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia every day in Ramadan I'm not sure yet if it's going to continue till the end of the Ramadan or to the first of the last 10 nights of Ramadan but hopefully inshallah the coming 20 nights or 20 days we will be inshallah trying our level best to study some aspects of Islam and we will have this program live as stated except on Friday the format of this program is as usual in Ramadan. The first half hour of the program is a topic that we will be discussing with you, inshallah. And the last half of the program would be, inshallah, uh, receiving your phone calls to answer your questions as usual. Islam Guide is a program that it is not that serious in the sense that I don't know anything about the title I just came to know about it like five minutes ago but the concept of the program should be interesting because when we look at Islam and when we look at the status of the Ummah we find that there is a problem there is something that is seriously wrong so what is wrong and how can we rectify it as Muslims this is what we will try to look into and the general idea of the program is that we lack the basics of Islam as simple as that if you look at how Islam is being practiced nowadays you'll find a lot of philosophical concepts innovated issues entering into Islam things that tarnish the reputation of Islam and if we want Islam to flourish as it was at the time of the Prophet and his companions may Allah be pleased with them all we have to go back to the basics and in order to do this, a few hours ago I was contemplating on how to introduce this program. And I remembered three or four hadiths of the Prophet ﷺ that had real profound meanings to them. So I thought of sharing them with you and to discuss a bit about what they entail. And hopefully we will get to understand some of the errors that we have fallen into. The first hadith is a very well-known hadith to all of you. The Prophet says, والسلام, the Jews split into 71 sects and the Christians split into 72 sects. This ummah, the Muslims, this nation will split into 73 sects, all of whom will be in the fire apart from one the companions inquired and asked O Prophet of Allah who are they the Prophet said والسلام, those who follow the same path as I as I and my companions follow now when you look at this hadith forget about the Jews and the Christians by the way this program is targeting the Muslims how to purify their Islam and how to abide by the teachings of the Quran and Sunnah yet all other denominations are more than welcome to watch it maybe they will not find some of the material relevant to their beliefs or maybe they would not understand some of it but inshallah you will find my email at the bottom of the screen and my contact uh, um, 
my contacts, in a sense, uh, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, I think, I don't know what else. And inshallah, you can email me. And if I can give you an answer that is short and concise, I will do that to the best of my ability. But this program, as stated, it is for the Muslims to purify their religion. So the Prophet is telling us in this hadith that the Muslims as a whole will be divided into 73 sects. All are in hellfire except one. Therefore, it is your obligation to identify whether you are one or part of the 72. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu salam, those who follow the same path as I and my companions follow. So, in order to rectify our errors and mistakes, we have to follow the path of the Prophet and his companions. And this is awkward to me in a sense when I come to read this hadith and say to myself, it would have been sufficient for the Prophet to have said, those who follow my path, that's more than enough. But why does he say, and my companions follow? Well, there's a very beautiful point that a lot of the Muslims had neglected, whether intentionally or unintentionally. We hear a lot of the Muslims saying that we will follow the Quran and the Sunnah. And by far, this is an obligation and a must. However, your intellect differs with mine, and our intellect differs with others. So each one claims that this is his understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah. No one on earth among the Muslims would stand up and say, I go against the Quran and the Sunnah, intentionally, deliberately. He would not be a Muslim. Anyone who does this, take it as a well-known fact. Anyone who goes against the Quran and Sunnah is not a Muslim. Anyone who says that, yes, I know that this is from the Quran, prescribed punishment. A, a, a thief, if convicted in a court of Islamic Sharia law, and the ruler rules that his hand must be amputated, then no, this is not suitable. This is not applicable. Anyone who does this is not a Muslim. And this is a small example. So among the 72 sects who are in hell, do you think or imagine for a second that any one of them says, I go against the Quran and Sunnah, I do not abide by the Quran and Sunnah? Definitely not. Because then they would be full-fledged kafir. However, each one of them claim, each one claims to be following the Quran and Sunnah, but not with the understanding of the companions. May Allah be pleased with them. And this is why the Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, those who follow the same path as I and my companions follow. And this is the only way of salvation, is to follow the Quran and the Sunnah with the understanding of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and those who follow them. Now, the path that the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, follows is what we know as the straight path. This is what we recite in Surah Al-Fatiha. Al Do you agree with that? The answer is yes. Alhamdulillah. Now, if it's a straight path, this means that this straight line, if you divert even few centimeters away from it, then you will have a fork of the road. Though the difference is slight and little in the very beginning, however, after a while, the gap will widen, and then you will see them far apart, which means that there is zero tolerance when it comes to following and abiding the Quran and the Sunnah with the understanding of the righteous predecessors, the companions, the tabi'een, and the tabi'at tabi'een. These are the righteous uh, uh, predecessors. Any slight diversion, 
will cause you to end up among the 72 if you are not careful. Now, going back to some of the hadiths mentioned, the Prophet said والسلام, when he gave us this constitution to follow, he said, I'm leaving among you two things, which if you adhere to them, you will not go astray after I'm gone. The book of Allah and my sunnah. So this takes us back to the first hadith. The saved sect is the one who follows the Quran and the sunnah with the understanding of the three preferred generations. Who are they? The Prophet said, the best of generation is my generation. Then that that follows it, then that that follows it. So the companions and the tabi'een and the tabi'it tabi'een. These are the best of generations. They were the closest to the Prophet ﷺ's time. They were the purest in understanding the Arabic language. And they had the least amount of innovation among them. So definitely their understanding to the Quran and to the Sunnah is far greater than ours. Now, when we come to the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, where he illustrates to us the reasons for what the Ummah is living in at the moment. And it's very awkward. Anyone who is pessimistic, anyone who's looking at the empty half of the glass rather than looking at the full half of the glass, would sit back, enjoy his cappuccino, after Maghrib, of course, now we're fasting, it's live, and contemplate on what's happening in the Ummah. He will see that the Muslim Ummah is in total humility. He will see that the disbelievers control the Muslim Ummah worldwide. They control them financially. They control them in the social aspects and brainwashing them through the media. They control them politically and militarily. Total control. No one can deny this and says, no, we are a sovereign country. We have the Let's not beat right around the bush. Secondly, we will find that Muslims are being slaughtered like sheep. We see it in Syria. We see it in Iraq. We see it in Afghanistan. We see it in Libya. We see it worldwide. We see Muslims throwing themselves in harm's way in the Mediterranean, and they're willing to drown for just fleeing some of them the fights and others just looking for a better way of living even if they would die in the process. If you look at how Muslims are committed to their religion, it's very sad, but there are those who claim to be Muslims, yet they're not Muslims. The way they deal with others, the way they practice Islam is totally wrong. They, yet they still are considered to be Muslims. But they lie, they cheat, they uh, uh, consume intoxicants, they fornicate, they sever their kinship, they do all the whole nine yards. Yet they're still Muslims. So what is the cause of this? Why are Muslims humiliated like this? Now the funny thing is, with all of this, Islam remains to be the fastest growing religion worldwide. And this is mind blowing. People convert, revert, enter Islam in the thousands every single day. No one is oppressing them. A great majority of those who accept Islam are females who are supposed to be oppressed in Islam. They're segregated, 
They're told to wear the hijab. They're looked down upon, so they claim. And nothing of this is happening, alhamdulillah, meaning in terms of oppression and looking down at them. But yes, they are told to wear the hijab, yet non-Muslim women are accepting Islam, wearing the hijab willingly, and content and happy with that. This is mind-blowing. Anyone would look at the data and would say that people should run away from Islam. The Christian, the, the, those who are non-Muslims would say, yeah, they're not running away from Islam because they're afraid of prosecution and being killed and being executed for apostasy. When was the last time you heard of any Muslim being executed for the act of apostasy? 1.7 billion people come and go in Islam like they wish. Nobody is implementing Sharia on them. So no one is afraid of leaving Islam because of the fear of execution. However, no one is leaving Islam because they have the conviction of Islam, which shows you that this religion is a real, true, final religion from Allah Azza wa Jal. And it's here to stay. People believe in it, they have strong conviction in it, and they abide by it no matter what. Nevertheless, I claim that the Muslims are humiliated everywhere. They don't have their dignity as they used to. They don't have their pride. Why is that? Well, I think I have about 10 minutes for the break. And um, I would again remind you that I see that there's a caller waiting. We will take the calls after the first break, not now, inshallah. So bear with me and don't waste your money on the phone lines. Um, give me another 10 to 12 minutes and then uh, ask me your questions and call if you wish. Listen to this hadith, a beautiful hadith. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu salam, if you engage in a transaction and are content with farming and hold on to the tails of cattle and you forsake jihad for the sake of Allah then Allah will cause you to be humiliated and will not relieve you of that until you return to your religion the hadith is crystal clear the Prophet is telling us about three treats three characteristics if the Ummah has them, Allah will humiliate the Ummah. Because whenever you transgress, Allah punish you. Whenever you make a mistake intentionally and deliberately and you don't follow, Allah will punish you. So this humiliation is par part of Allah's punishment. Though we are the best of nations to Allah, yet because we have done this grave mistake Allah Azza wa Jal is correcting our path through such punishment. So the Prophet says, if you engage in Eena transaction, what is Eena transaction? Eena is a transaction which is part of riba, usury, interest based, based transactions. What's the ruling on giving you a thousand? euros as a loan and you returning them as 1200 euros 200 euros are total riba a major sin totally prohibited so in order for me to change and twist some of the facts so that I can make it permissible I make a trick and this trick is not to trick others but rather to trick Allah that's why it is a major sin and it is even worse than actual straightforward riba. So I tell you, would you buy this pen from, from me in installments for 1,200 euros, 100 euro every month for a full year? You said, okay, I will do that. 
because you came to me yesterday and asked me for a loan of a thousand euros and I said I don't give loans I'm not a charity so today I came with this ingenious devious idea so I said buy this pen from me for 1200 euros in installments 100 euro per month I said okay then what then I say to you, I will buy it for, from you cash for a thousand euro. And you agree. So I take the pen and I give it to you. And now you owe me 1200 euros. Now I buy it from you in the same time and I give you cash a thousand euros. This is clear riba. This is called Aina. What, why is it riba? Because the pen is still in my possession. I actually gave you a thousand euros cash in returns for 1200 in installments. So this is total riba. So the Prophet is indicating, والسلام, the first problem is when the Muslims start to play tricks with Allah, trying to fool Allah Azza wa Jal. And those who are doing it fail to actually announce it but they intend it and that is why any kind of trick is totally prohibited and it's even worse the Prophet told us والسلام, that there will be people who would consume intoxicants will consume wine and name it with other than its original name so now in Arabic we call it spiritual drinks but there are so many different types and names of that intoxicant in, in, the, in the Quran it's called khamr but someone says no I'm not drinking wine I'm not drinking khamr I'm drinking vodka or tequila or rum or brandy or uh, whiskey or scotch or whatever uh, uh, name they give and they say alhamdulillah it's not wine it's not from grapes this is a trick because the end result is the same in the Quran and in the Sunnah that those who consume it are cursed so the first thing is that a person deals in haram transaction and then unfortunately it's really sad how a number of those who pretend to fool the Muslims camouflage their haram transactions with Islamic transactions so many Islamic banks deal in prohibited things and sometimes they have a Sharia board but the Sharia board either gives them a fatwa generally speaking but not follow its implementation in the transactions of bank so they tell you this is the fatwa but the way it's being implemented is against the Sharia board but the Sharia board is not there to audit it. Or those who are on the Sharia board are not qualified. And they get hefty bonuses at the end of the year. And they're so filthy rich to the extent that when it comes to signing, they would say, hmm, yeah, I think it, it's possible. And they sign, knowing that they'll get something out of that. And not all of them, alhamdulillah. But there are those who may bend the rules, if not break them, so that they would gain money out of it. And this is one of the three aspects that the Prophet والسلام, told us that this would cause the Muslim Ummah to, to fall under the humility of Allah Azza wa to them in return for what they had earned. We have a short break. Inshallah, if we return, I'll be taking your calls. And if there are no calls, we will continue discussing our topic, Inshallah. So stay tuned. Yeah, Allah, Allah, oh yeah, Allah. alaikum and welcome back. So the lines are open now if you care to call with your question. And till we receive the first caller, inshallah. So the first thing is tricking Allah Azza wa Jal. And there are great number of different ways of doing so and falling in hellfire while doing so 
For example, we know that when a person divorces his wife for three times, they're not allowed to reconcile until she marries another man. Now, sometimes they may make a trick and the woman or the husband or the ex that is, or someone comes and marries her for a night so that he divorces her afterwards and she can remarry her ex again. This is something that was cursed by Allah Azza wa Jal. The Prophet said, those who commit something either for them from their own selves or for others, they will be cursed by Allah Azza wa Jal. Samir from Saudi. Samir. Hello, Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much for uh, giving us opportunity yes, to sir. ask questions. Alhamdulillah, first of all, I congratulate you for your Ramadan Kareem. Jazakallah khair. Uh, my question is, uh, if I wish to take a loan from the bank, like a Raji bank, so I went to them and said, we cannot give you money, but we can sell you the stocks, whatever the amount you need. So then you can either take, uh, keep the stocks with you or sell it back. So whatever the amount you get, so that will be your loan and we take uh, one or two or three percent of uh, admission of fee. I asked them, is it a riba? They said, no, it's not riba. It is just uh, because you are selling the stocks. Suppose if you take the stocks for 100 real and when you give us back or you want to sell it out, so they may be, they may not be in 100 real, but it may be 95 or 105. So on top of that, when you pay us back, so we'll take from you maybe 1%, 2%, 3%, something like that. Is it halal, Sheikh, please? Okay, I will answer you, though your voice all of a sudden declined as if yeah, it's fading away. But uh, alhamdulillah, I managed to understand your question, Brother Samir. I will answer Great. you. I will answer Thank you, you very Shah. much. You're welcome. First of all, brothers and sisters do not be fooled by what some of the laymen may say that I took a loan from an Islamic bank this is not possible a conventional bank is based on riba all what they do all their transactions most of it is based on riba whether it's long term short term on the spot, whatever. It is based on dealing with riba. So what they do is they either borrow or they lend. And there's always a percentage, whether it is 0.5 cent on big amounts of money, short time, a term, or something longer and longer period of time. It all depends. An Islamic bank never gives you a loan. I would never go to a bank and say, listen, I need 100,000. He says, okay, inshallah, here's 100,000. Because it's not a charity. He would not give me 100,000 without any benefit for him. So what does or how does an Islamic bank work? An Islamic bank works through a different number of um, what they call windows or transactions or ways of dealing. So they either sell you something directly and they make their profit out of the sale. Or they may go into partnership with you. So they join forces or they go into what is known as mudaraba. So they provide the money and you provide the logistics and the work and so on. The most famous way of getting money from the bank is through what is known as tawarruq. Tawarruq is the bank selling you a commodity. You acquire this commodity and you go and sell it elsewhere to cash the money. Now, what is the ruling on me selling Ahmed, this pen, for a dollar cash and selling another pen or identical pen to Abdullah for two dollars cash. Does Abdullah have the right to say, why are you selling Ahmed 
for a dollar and selling it to me for two dollars? He doesn't have the right to say that. It's my pen. I can sell it for a gazillion dollars. Who cares? This is mine. So I have the right to determine the price. Now, in another situation, if I sell it to Abdullah for two dollars, but I'm kind to him, and I say, listen, you don't have to pay it cash. Pay it over the duration of uh, a few months or few years. Is it okay? Definitely is okay, providing that the final price is fixed. So it is $2. That's it. If we agree for five months, if he comes and he says that I can't pay and he prolongs it into seven months, into a year, the $2 remain. This transaction, the, the selling and buying has been made. Cashing the money, the price, it has not been made fully, but the price is final. So now let's go back to the Islamic Bank. I need money. I need cash. So I go to them. And I say, I'd like the amount of $100,000. How can you guys provide me? They say to me, well, these are our warehouses. We have air conditions for sale. We have steel rods. We have cement. We have this and that. Oh, we have cars. You pick and choose. So I go and I pick. And I choose this uh, amount or commodity that I'm interested in buying. And we agree on the price. And they sell it to me with a fixed price that cannot be increased at all and the terms of payment. I take the commodity, I go somewhere else, I sell it to a third party who is not connected to the bank. Of course, he will buy it with like 2-3% less because it's not brand new and it's not from the agent or from uh, uh, the owner of the company. And I get the money. This is known as tawarruq and it's completely fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Now, where are the loopholes in Islamic transactions, Islamic banks, whether in Dubai, whether in Saudi Arabia, whether in London, whether in New York. The problem is that when they start to bend the rules a little bit, and unfortunately, some of the Sharia board sign only on the face of it without looking what's behind or in between the lines. So I go to an Islamic bank, and I say, I need 100,000 euros. They said, OK, we will sell you this commodity for 120,000 euros. This is our profit, 20%. Agree? I agree. So OK, sign. I sign. Then they come with another document and say, OK, now this is authorization from you to us to sell this commodity on your behalf for 95,000 euros. Agree? I said, OK. I sign. Five minutes later, it's in my bank account, $95,000 uh, uh, or euros. This is totally haram. Why? First of all, because I did not see the commodity. I did not actually buy it, possess it, own it. It's only on paper. To the best of my knowledge, this is nothing. Maybe they have a pile of cement for sale, but there are a hundred different branches around the country selling the same uh, 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 amount of cement to a hundred different buyers and then buying it from them. So this is a trick, like in the beginning when I spoke about al ina the pen is still in my custody. It's just something that we pretended to do to trick Allah Azza wa Jal. Selling him for 1,200, buying it from him for 1,000 cash, Alhamdulillah. So this is not permissible. Now, coming back to Samir's question. If you, Samir, go to the Rajhi and you ask them for a commodity and they tell you we will sell you stocks, a Rajhi bank, like Al Bilad, like Al Jazeera, they have stocks in their possession. And once they sell it for you with an agreed 
price, it enters your portfolio. It is owned by you. So you can keep it there for a day, for a week, for a year. No one forces you to sell it. Now, when you sell it, it is you who's punching in your username and, and password and then looking at the prices of that day and then say, yes, sell. And you sell the whole amount or half of it or part of it. And you will find that the money is in your bank account. So as I stated, there is no collaboration between the Rajhi Bank, yourself, and the buyer. The buyer is someone anonymous. Now, what scares me is that if the bank itself does all this, the buying and the selling, in this case, this to me is not permissible. They have to sell you these shares, these stocks, put it in your portfolio, and then it is your call to sell it whenever you want on your own without even referring to them or without them buying it from you again. And I hope this answers your question. Of course, similar situations occur nowadays with mortgage. And we know that mortgage is haram, whether it's in uh, uh, the US or in Europe or any Muslim or non-Muslim country, because the final price keeps on changing and it's an interest-based loan. And we've seen what the mortgage had done in 2008 when the credit crunch took place and how that these mortgages were the main driver for the fall of the markets worldwide. Alhamdulillah, the Muslim world that deals with Islamic banking was the only type of economy that was preserved and saved. The uh, Islamic banks did not suffer because they don't deal in riba. They don't deal in haram, in selling by the mar margin and, and, and stipulating prices, etc., and doing all of this, alhamdulillah. Okay, so coming back to the hadith, if you engage in ina transactions, we run through that. And are content with farming and hold on the tails of cattle. The Prophet is telling us that when the Muslim ummah is content with this life, with this world, so they are happy with farming, they are happy with um, getting money through transactions, whether halal or haram, no problem, but they're interested only in cultivating the land rather than executing what Allah Azza wa Jal had ordered us to do. Once they fall into this, then this is the second criteria and we'll go back to it inshallah after we take Muhammad from Ethiopia. Uh, hello, assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Assalamu wa rahmatullah. Uh, I want to ask you one question. Yes. Uh, for example, if I am a shopkeeper, uh, is what? I am a shopkeeper. For example, okay. I sell one commodity for or residents of uh, our village. One hundred. Okay. If uh, other uh, newcomer from other country, for example, it may be from Somalia, from other country, I I sell to them in 150 or 20 years. Okay. Finish. Uh, is it fair in our region? Okay. Any more questions? Finish. Any more questions? Okay, two other, uh, other questions. Yes, yes, Muhammad. Any other question? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, for example, if, uh, when I am watching the Hula TV, is, uh, Azan is writing from Moscow, I hear Azan. I should have to pause Huda TV and uh, listen to uh, Azan, or I continue to hear. Okay, Please? okay. Any more questions? Uh, enough. Thank you for... You're, you're welcome, Akhi. Uh, Brother Muhammad from Ethiopia, if I understand his question correctly, he's saying that if I buy a product, an item, 
for 100 and I sell it in my village for 150 or 200 is this fair see there isn't anything in Islam that limits your profit I could buy something and sell it for 20 percent profit 30 percent a hundred percent providing I'm not fooling the Muslims by making them believe that it is something much more expensive and important than what it really is providing I am not harming the Muslims for example the village I live in they don't have rice so I managed to get rice for a hundred uh, uh, per bag and because no one has rice I raise the price into a thousand people are forced to buy because there's no other alternative I'm sinful in this case one would say oh there is free trade no this is not free trade this is capitalism you're not entitled to harm the Muslims if there are a hundred other shops that sell rice other than me there's no problem in doing that so there is no ceiling for your profit but you have to be as much as possible kind with the other Muslims not to harm them and not to exaggerate in that and Allah knows best uh, Jalil from Afghanistan Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, you know, I, I want to ask a question. Uh, promoting peace is uh, was the main uh, goal of Islam, but there are endless war in Yemen. Several countries like Yemen, Akhi, know, Syria. Uh, Jalil, Jalil. Uh, <laughs> the same questions. I want to ask again. You I've, I've, I've missed you. Just, I've missed you for about uh, a couple of months peace. now. I have uh, missed you for ending this is not a question wars. yeah Jalil yeah Jalil this is not a question you always call to inquire about the war in Yemen that Saudi is waging against the Muslims in Yemen and you start making all these regular uh, cry wolf stuff all in all you're wasting our time the war against the Shia in Yemen is a legitimate jihad it is not waged by Saudi Arabia it is waged by a coalition of Muslim countries alhamdulillah and the Shia will destroy everything in their path if they were left to do this they have done this in Iraq and we can see it clearly what they're doing with the Sunnis and killing them and slaughtering them whether they are the official uh, 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 army uh, forces or al hashd al shabi may Allah Azza wa Jal burn them in hell. Uh, we see them also in Syria and their collaboration with Hezbollah, the Hezb of the devil, and Iran and Russia, killing the Muslims, slaughtering them, destroying their lands, their masjids, everything that is green. After they had destroyed Chechnya, they destroyed Afghanistan now they want to destroy Syria so you my friend should at least be honored to be a Muslim if you're a Muslim and stop these childish games and attacking a legitimate jihad against these Houthis who are killing the Muslims and destroying the land and we can see exactly what is happening there May Allah Azza wa Jal give you guidance. Faisal from Lebanon. Hey, yeah, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I have uh, uh, two questions. What's different between law and shar in Islam? Second and question. What's different, what, uh, the second question is, uh, what's different between zakat and tax? Okay. And I would ask um, another, uh, you know, uh, I can make some media or uh, documentary or even clips about ISIS. And I want to ask you, uh, would you show and publish uh, in your channel, please? And I know uh, uh, the uh, ISIS is an evil group or an evil group and terrorism. Uh, and of course, I know your policy, your channel's policy. 
Okay, can I? I will answer yes. you. I will answer you, inshallah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Mohammed from Ethiopia's uh, second question. He says that I am watching Huda TV and the Adhan is being called. So should I repeat after the Adhan or continue to watch Huda TV? I would highly recommend that you repeat after the Adhan and you can at the same time uh, continue to uh, uh, listen to Peace TV uh, or to Huda TV without any problem. The Adhan is being called. I know what he's saying. Once he stops, I say, Ash Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And I continue to watch it, inshallah, and there's no problem. Faisal from Lebanon, Lebanon says, what's the difference between law and sharia? Ah? Law is a general terminology which has documentation, which has precedents, which has cases that you can relate to. Sharia ah is the law of the Quran and Sunnah that the jurors manage to put to channel this. So Sharia ah is the Islamic law. But the word law can be the French law, the British law, the uh, American law, etc. Uh, um, uh, not necessarily Islamic. The difference between zakat and taxation is that taxation is man-made. And they take taxation, whether they're rich or poor, whether the people are willing or not, whether the uh, people have money or not, they will take taxation. Now, in Islam, zakat is prescribed on certain types of money. So gold, silver, and monetary currencies, one. The things that come from the earth, that is the grains, dates, um, uh, grapes, etc. Uh, not the fruits or the vegetables. These are unzakatable, but are the, uh, specific types. The cattle, livestock, so camels, cows, sheep, and goats. And finally, anything that is made and prepared for selling and buying. These are the zakatable amounts, and there is a threshold. If below it, there is no zakat, and it has to uh, finish a period of time. If before it, then there is no zakat. Uh, your, his final uh, question was about preparing uh, video clips, because he's good in the media, about NISIS, not ISIS. It's called non-Islamic state of Iraq and uh, Sham or Syria. And he says, can the, the channel uh, air it? I have no idea about the policy of the channel. You can prepare these uh, video clips. And if they are well prepared and nice and authentic, maybe uh, share it with the um, administration of uh, Huda TV. And inshallah, they will look into it and see what is beneficial to do. And with this, we come to the conclusion of today's program until we meet you tomorrow inshallah same time i leave you fi amanillah wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh